Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank y'all so much for joining us tonight. This is the introduction of our Experience in God book. If you want to purchase it, it is the rust color Experience in God book. We will be covering the workbook. If you want to purchase it, make sure you purchase the workbook. There are several copies of the Experience in God book, but we are concerned with the workbook. Let's go to God in prayer. Eternal God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus of Christ we come, Lord, we honor you, we bless your name. God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us and keeping us and giving us another chance to honor your word, to hear your word, to obey your word. Bless us tonight, Father God, as we study your word, that your word will fall on good soil, that your word will make us better, that your word, Father God, will function us to move on just a little while longer. Lord, speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Experiencing God. I've had this class probably a couple of times now. Uh, the Rust Color book is the new one. It is the Experiencing God workbook that we're looking at tonight. Tonight we begin with a handout instead of the book. We'll begin with the handout and also uh, we have a scripture that we will cover on tonight. This is the introduction. Experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God by Henry Blackaby and Claude King. And also, they have included this time the son of Henry Blackaby and the, Black, the grandson of Henry Blackaby, Richard Blackaby and Mike Blackaby. So let's get into experiencing God. If you would volunteer for me to, to look at and to read scripture. Our first scripture is Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And John 15, verses 1 through 5. John 15. If I can get three volunteers. John 15, 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 through 5. And then Psalm 25, verse number 4. Psalm, we'll begin with Psalm 25, verse number 4. The goal of this study is to create a life transforming encounter with God. Do you all get a hand out somewhere? The goal is to have a life transforming encounter with God. Who has Psalm 25 verses 4 and 5? Psalm 25 verse 4 and 5 reading from the New King James. Jane, show me your way, O Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all the day. Amen. Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 5, who's there? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So the goal of the study is to have a life-transforming encounter with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Let a man show account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God Moreover, it is required as stewards that a man be found thankful. For with me, it is a very small thing that I shall be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges, me is the Lord. 
Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and we may manifest the counsel of the heart, and then, then shall every man have praise of God. Amen. John 15, 1 through 5. John 15, 1 through 5. John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Amen. So, when we look at how the authors begin the book, they begin in Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. It talks about the fact that in order to have a life tra transforming encounter with God, I, and, and as we go through the through the study, I will be using the word I because we want to make it personal. I must give my entire life to God. I personally, I must give my entire life to God. Who I want to give my life to? I want to give my life to God. In order to have a life-transforming encounter, you have to give it to God. You have to give your entire life to God. Secondly, I trust that God will not allow me to be disgraced. Verses, I'm dealing, I'm dealing with verses 1 through 5 and Psalm 25. And the highlight is are verses 4 through 5. He says, I must give my entire life to God. You can't give him part of it, you gotta give him all of it. If you're gonna participate in a transforming life with God, you have to give your entire life, everything, to God. Every part of your being has to be given to the Lord. If you're going to have a life transforming encounter with God. You got to give your whole life to Him. Psalm 25, 1 through 5 says, You got to give Him everything. Secondly, He says, I must trust that God will not allow me to be disgraced. As I give my entire life to God, I'm going to trust God that God can shield me from disgrace. When I work for the Lord, when I live for the Lord, the Lord himself is going to make sure, I'm on my second point on Psalm 25, God is going to make sure that I'm not disgraced. But first I got to do what? I got to give my entire life to him. The old preacher would say it like this, you must be, you got to be, you have to be, Born again. That's right. Amen, amen. If your life is going to be in the hand of the Lord, you got to be born again. What is born again? What, what does that mean? Born again. Doesn't mean anything. Is it just a word we use? What, is, what do we mean when we say we must be born again? What does that mean? We must be born again. Refresh. Watch it. Watch it. See it. Refresh. Sin is gone. What is, how do we get there? How, how are we born again? How, why is it necessary to be born again? Is it necessary to be born again? Yes. It is? Why is it necessary to be born again? Why is it necessary for us to give our whole life to God? And the only way we can give it to him is to be born again. So why is it necessary? 
So God can bless you. Well, you first have to give your life, your life over to Christ, to Jesus Christ. Okay, so we got to give our life over to Jesus Christ. How do we go about doing that? Accepting him as our personal Savior. Okay, accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. What do we believe if we're going to accept Christ as our Savior? What do we? What is the one thing, two things, three things, four things we need to believe? Or uh, is that two, three, or four, five things? We, what do we need to believe in order to be born again? Anything? Or we just wake up one morning and say, "Oh, I'm born another day." <laughs> we must be born again. Get your hand out right there, brother. One of those pages. Okay. We must be born again. Somebody tell me something. Why? How are we born again? Why are we born again? We got to be refreshed. We got to be renewed. How does that take place? How, how are we born again? Sin has been forgiven. Pray and ask God to believe the story of salvation. Believe the salvation story. What is that story? That God sent his son. To God sent his son. That Jesus did come. That is a reality that Jesus came and Jesus voluntarily gave his life. And he rose from the dead. And Jesus, he died for our sins. Right? And after he died, they buried him in a grave. And then after they buried him in the grave, he rose from the dead. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 1, 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. Who's there? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Let's talk about this new birth thing. Let's talk about giving our lives to Christ. Let's talk about it. Yes, ma'am. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand by which you also are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Okay, so the first point we know is that Christ died. We have to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus exists, Jesus gave his life. It was a voluntary death. He died for our sins. Christ died. Jesus Christ was buried. Jesus Christ was raised or he rose from the dead. He was raised by the power of God from the dead. That's why there's so much excitement around the fact that when we get to this point in our teaching, we get excited. We get excited over the fact that Jesus actually died, gave his life for us as a ransom, meaning that he bought us back. He died for us on Calvary. And when he died for us, they buried him into a cave or a grave. And when they buried him, he stayed there. But early the third day morning, he rose from the dead. We believe that he died on Friday. We believe that he stayed in the graves Friday and Saturday. We believe that he rose early that third day morning. Some people would tell you that's not three days. Because in order to have a complete day, you got to go from Friday to Saturday. That's one day. From Saturday to Sunday, that's two days. As we know it. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I run into a lot of people that, like, a lot of people think that they took his life. He didn't, they didn't take it voluntarily. Right. Like you said, he gave his life. And a lot of people misunderstand that. They think that the, uh, when they hung him on the cross that they took his life. No, they didn't. He voluntarily gave it because he could have called down a legion of angels. Yes, to free him from that. Yes, sir. So it, it was a voluntary death, right? Right, right. He didn't even fight back. I mean, they they whipped him and pulled plugs of skin and plugs of veins and 
and plugs of arteries and plugs of meat out of his bones. I mean, snatched it out. It was a horrible death. It was crucifixion. It was so devastating until no Roman citizen could be crucified. Jesus the Jew got killed on Calvary. They nailed him in his hands. Theologians believe it was his wrists. Some believe it was his hands. They nailed him to a cross. And he didn't squirm and fight back. He didn't cuss him out. Matter of fact, he prayed for him. He voluntarily gave his life. He voluntarily died for you and for me. It was horrible. We think we're going through something right now. Jesus went through something. He died. They took him off the cross. Mm -hmm. He was buried in, a, in Joseph's brand new tomb, a tomb that no man had ever laid in. Joseph volunteered his tomb to bury the Savior. He laid in the tomb, but early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. It was three days. Who wants to explain how we get three days out of what we know as two days? How do we get three days? The Bible distinctively says on the third day, bright and early in the morning, Mary and the other Mary, and they ran to the tomb to announce his body. He wasn't there, but he had been in the grave three days. Who wants to help me out? Anybody? Anybody? I would, I would, I would say because they counted it as a, as the, as like the name of the day: Friday, Saturday, then Sunday. But he got up before Sunday got here. <laughs> he got up, he got up early. He got up on that Sunday morning, but we can't count that Sunday because he got up early that third day morning, right? That's, yeah. So three days we know. From Friday to Saturday is how many days? One day. From Saturday to Sunday is how many days? Two days, right? And the Bible says three days. Because they didn't find him until by that he was missing until after the third day? No, three days. How do we count three days? Because of the Jewish calendar. Because the Jewish calendar counted three days as one, one day was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's a full day. And then 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., that's the second day. 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is the third day. So the, the Jewish clock did not operate like our 24-hour clock. So it wasn't, it wasn't 36 hours as we know it. It was a day, 12-hour day, 12-hour day, 12-hour day. He rose early the third day. Yes? He got up early the third day morning. He rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit, God got him up by way of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that dwells in us and walks in us, lives in us, the whole same Holy Spirit that unctions us to stop doing wrong and do what's right, that same Holy Spirit, the Bible says, when it says he rose, that means he roused him from the dead. And if we just believe that story, just this little simple story, if we just believe this little simple story, that's all it takes to be saved. That's it. You don't have to run around and say 10 Hail Marys to be saved. Amen. You don't have to roll on the floor. You don't have to shout. You don't have to speak in other tongues. Just trust this story. Of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It is so simple, nobody can mix it. Only the smart folks mix it. Smart people miss it all the time. Because we can be so smart until we miss it and we're looking for a reason for what it is. After, after studying, studying over 40 years trying to find out one thing about God, I am still trying to figure out how to explain the trend. How do I explain the Trinity? How, how do I say God is three persons? 
in one. After over 40, over 50 years, I'm still trying to figure out how do I explain the truth. And I personally is not smart enough, am not smart enough, I am not smart enough to figure it out. Because he's God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. We can say, well, we can, we can explain him by one man being a father, a husband, and an employee, but that doesn't fit God. We can say ice comes in three different forms. We can say you have water, liquid, you have ice, which is solid, and we have gas, which is a vapor, but that doesn't do God justice. Some things we're going to find out when we get to heaven. But one thing we have to know for sure, and that is that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried in a borrowed tomb, he rose early that third day morning, and because we have trust that story, we can get to heaven. There's no work we can do, there's no service we can do, only trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and on resurrection. That's the only way we get to heaven. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, Paul says that we can't even brag about it. It's grace that saves us. It is faith by which we are, through which we are saved. It is a gift of God. And we can't brag about it. God is such an awesome God, he put man in a point where he can't brag about it. We can't even take credit for it. You know, people walk around talking about, oh, I've been saved 40 years. Yeah, but you can't brag about it. Because you couldn't save yourself. Only God saves us through Jesus Christ. Let's look at Psalm 25, verses 4 through 5, 1 through 5. I said to you, I must give my entire life to God. And in order to give my entire life to God, I must be born again. This new birth experience is a supernatural experience. Now, I remind you now, we're talking to believers. The book is written to believers. So once we're saved, once we're saved one time, Jesus died one time, so once we're saved one time, we are always saved. Preacher priest one time and he said, my wife and I went to Hawaii and we came back and we still say, <laughs> As if there was a great revelation. <laughs> what he was saying is, we didn't do wrong stuff. But what I'm saying is, even if you had done wrong stuff, before you mounted the plane, if you were saved before you mounted the plane, when you got back on the plane, back to coming back this way, you're still saved. Mm -hmm. The question is, were you saved before you got on the plane? Yeah. Were you saved before you reached the shores? Were you saved before you went wherever you went and did whatever you did? Because we move from sanctification, from, from salvation to sanctification. Salvation is justification. And the reason why the senior saints used to say it's just as if you had not sinned when they talk about justification is simply because we can't take credit for it. How many people sin today? Just one thing today. Anybody? Oh, y'all all holy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, let me let me announce to the world. At the new beginning church, no one sins today. Yeah, the thoughts I had when I came outside and they had a uh, face, face frame my car. I said, Oh, I'm going to get my car. Uh, at that point, I said, I see. <laughs> he unctions us to give our entire life to God. He says, I trust that God will not allow me to be. Disgraced. The psalmist goes on and he says, God will not allow my enemies to rejoice in my defeat or rejoice over my defeat. 
I'm talking about the God who keeps us. The God who continues to bless us. Our enemies don't have the right to rejoice. And guess what? We don't have the right to rejoice in the failures of our enemies. Jesus says love them. Jesus says bless them. But the good news today is we trust that God will not allow us to be his grace and God will not allow my enemies to disgrace me. Look at the God we serve. He is the awesome and the amazing God. Therefore, this should be our prayer. Look at, look at your hand out here. This should be our prayer. This is my prayer. Lord, verses 4 through 5, Psalm 25, verses 4 through 5. Lord, show me the right path. Show me the right way. Show me the right direction. Lord, show me the right path. Point out to me the road to follow. Because I'm giving my whole life to you. And as I give my whole life to you, Lord, show me the right path. Show me the right road to follow. Point out to me the right road to follow. My prayer is, Lord, Lead me through your word of truth. Lord, lead me. Lead me through your word of truth. Lord, guide me. I got this big old Bible. I mean, it's a big old Bible, too. I mean, I got this, this big old Bible. Six or six books. Whole lot of writing. But Lord, lead me through it. In other words, we ought to pray the word and pray over the word. Who want to tell me the difference? Pray the word and pray over the word. We ought to pray the word. When we pray the word, we walk outside, somebody damaged our car. God, you said that you can keep me in the midst of the storm. <laughs> Lord, you said for me to wait on you. Lord, you said that you will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Lord, I'm standing on your word. Lord, lead me through your word. Try it sometime. Instead of watching steam come out your ears and your nose. Instead of cussing it out. Instead of fussing it out. Remind God of God's word. God, lead me through your word of truth. So we ought to pray the word, right? And we ought to pray over the word. Lord, I believe your word. Bless me to understand your word. Lord, as I meditate in your word. Lord, I'm pulling out my Bible. I'm about to study your word. Lord, speak to me through your word. Lord, unction me now with your word. God, bless me through your word. God, I trust nothing more than I trust your word. Because God, you value your word. You value your name. And now, Lord, I value your word. Have you ever wondered why every year we either read the Bible or we listen to the Bible and we don't go get any additions and we do the same Bible over and over? Have you ever wondered? Did you think that I forgot last year we listened to the Bible? Did you think that my mind just, I think we'll do something new. We'll listen to the Bible this year. Did you think I just had lost it? I mean, the same word that gives strength, the same word that gives us direction, we want God to lead us through this word. I'm telling you, because there's a lot going on. I told you the other day, when the news reporter said, it's a lot going on, it's a lot going on. And then they had the desk to say, our job is to make sense of it. I just can't make any sense of it. You gotta ask somebody smarter than me. Therefore, I want God to lead me through his word because his word is truth. Next part of my prayer is, Lord, teach me, for you are the God who saves me. God, you teach me. You're the God who saved me, meaning you're the God that delivered my soul. Now, Lord, teach me because you'll continue to save me, delivering me from hardship. 
See, salvation, everywhere that salvation is mentioned in the Bible is not talking about saving your soul. Many times it's talking about saving you from disaster. And we, we may get to that tonight. Save me from disaster. When Peter was walking on water going to Jesus and he began to sink, guess what? Peter just said, Lord, here I am again with my face bowed down before mothers just calling on you one no more time, Lord. I'm not coming by no shape, form, or fashion, Lord. I'm not coming for any outside show. Peter didn't have time for that. Guess what Peter said? Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And, and the, the, the psalmist in Psalm 25 gives credit to the God who has saved him. Then his prayer says, my hope is in you, God. The psalmist said, I have no other hope other than hoping in you. My hope is in you, God. At the Holy Street Church, they have a banner that says hope. When you go inside, right above the, the baptismal pool, the big old word, the big old bold letters and big lights says hope. On the outside it says hope is here. Hope is here. And people are, are going through some things and they just need some hope. Matter of fact, people are looking for hope. Have you ever been to the back bedside of a loved one that was on life support or getting ready to transition and you look forward to a finger to move or an eye to flash or an elbow to, to jump? You're just looking for just a glimmer of hope. And even though the doctor said they are already gone, you're standing over the bed and you're looking around and you're looking down, you're looking at the machine. Well, the blood pressure is still up. Mm -hmm. Well, the heartbeat is still moving. Oh, he just, and you'll get on the phone and call up. Oh, he moved this out. Mm -hmm. It's because you're looking for a glimmer of hope. If we're going to be so winners for the Lord, we got to give folks hope. We can't make promises to them as to how God is going to deliver them or keep them, but we can give them hope. Hope is here. Jesus is our hope. God, we close closing our prayer. Please remember your compassion and unfailing love which you showed me in the past. God, I need you to remember God, I'm calling to your attention. We're praying over the word, right? The psalmist did not have the word the way we have the word. But the psalmist is telling God, God, I know you remember because you are the omniscient God. You know everything. Now, God, remember. In other words, manifest yourself. Show that you remember. Give me favor. And Lord, if you give me favor, I'm going to brag on you. When you give me favor, Lord, I'm going to continue to talk about it. He says, God, please remember the compassion you had in, time, in times past. God, you had compassion. And you had compassion on me. That's why we can't look down our nose at other folk. Because God was patient with us. God had compassion with us. God dealt with us in such with such favor that we didn't even deserve it. And here we are being saved yesterday, and now we look down our nose at other folk. You cannot look down on other people because your sin is different than theirs. Because you have some. As long as you walk around in these mortal bodies, sin will be present. I can wear a white suit, white tie, white shirt, white shoes, and step out here looking like I just walked out of the clouds, but I'm still sinful. 
So we have salvation. God delivered us from sin. We have sanctification. God delivered us, salvation, God delivered us from sin, from the sin's penalty, from the penalty of sin. We have sanctification. God delivers us from the power of sin. I'm sanctified. And people like to say it too, but, and they can say it with a flash. They can say it with an attitude. And you got to put that woo on there when you say it. I'm saved, sanctified, and woo, filled with his precious Holy Ghost. We are sanctified. Sanctified means that I'm set apart, I'm different, I'm not what I used to be. But just because you are sanctified, you can't bother with other folk and their sin. And the third thing, when God saved us, he glorified us. He will put us in a position where we are saved from the presence of sin. Now, that doesn't happen until you're dead mm -hmm. or until you rapture. If Jesus comes right now, we are in his glory. We have glorified bodies. God has saved us. He has put us in a position where we are saved from the penalty of sin, we are saved from the power of sin, and we will be saved from the presence of sin. You know there's no sin in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's none. There's no sin in heaven. God is not going to be around sin. And that's the only time we're going to have a sinless mind, sinless body, is when we leave here. This world is contaminated. Yes, God. It is contaminated. Yes, it is. And you can't fix it like they say you can fix it in the chemical plant. In the chemical plant, they say two things. Number one, if you can't do it right, do it at night. <laughs> what they're saying is when they let out pollutants in the air and pollutants in the water, they do it at night. That doesn't work with God. If you can't do it right, do it at night. While well, everybody's asleep, 2 o'clock in the morning, big plume, plumes going up. The next thing they say is the best solution to pollution is dilution. The best solution to pollution is dilution. That doesn't work with God. What they're saying is if you dilute it with enough water, or you put enough caustic in there, or you put enough chlorine in there, it'll neutralize it. And it'll be like new again. Mm -hmm. If you titrate it, it'll look just like it used to look. Mm -hmm. It'll become clear. That doesn't work with God. Mm -hmm. The only thing that works with God is to get you out of planet Earth. You get to heaven, you got a glorified body. I am glorified. You can't even brag about being glorified right now. You got to leave here. This world is contaminated. This world is messed up. So our prayer should be, God, please remember your compassion and your unfailing love which you have shown me in the past. Have God shown you any kind of love or any compassion? I mean, when I deserve to be locked up. When I deserve to be pulled over. God allowed me to wave at the cop and go by. I changed pants before I got here, and guess what? No wallet, no license, no insurance. I'm just out here stuck by truck. truck. And now I'm reminding God, God, give me compassion to get back to the house. That's right. God, grant me compassion just to make it. God, show your unfailing love toward me one more time. And Lord, I won't do that again. And guess what? I do it again. <laughs> if you go home and change pants. Lord, give me mercy. <laughs> give me mercy. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. First Corinthians chapter 4. Be faithful. That's not on your paper. Be faithful. I mean, if we had all faithful Christians, 
we would have had this world turn right side up once again. If people would just be faithful. Just, just be faithful. Just commit to what you are called to do and do it with all you have. Be faithful. No excuses. Be faithful. All of us got an excuse. I, I can dream of one right now. <laughs> and we don't have to think hard to have excuses. But we just have to be faithful. I have to serve God and others with my whole heart. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, I have to be willing to serve God and serve others with all my heart. With everything that is within me. Yeah, yeah, you know, we have a habit of, of touching right here because we, we, we think it's talking about our heart. But we're not talking about the pump that floods pump blood to every extreme of the extremity of the body. We're talking about our innermost being. God judges the heart. Men judge on the outside. I told you when I first met one of my wife's friends, she said, look at that boy and that pig head. She judged me based on my head. <laughs> she judged me based on whether or not I had a fro or not. She based me looking at my receding hairstyle. But God looks at the heart. Your innermost being, what you feel, what you think, how you act. God judged you on the heart. Men judge you on what they see. God judge you on what men can't see. Your innermost being. I have to serve God and serve others with my whole heart. It, it matters little about human authority. In other words, you ought to have Integrity to the point where what people say or just makes up your reputation. But what God says delivers your character. Are you what people say about you? Are you what people think about you? Because when your reputation lines up with your character, then that's who you are. If people say that's you and then that's really you, that's who you are. Who are you? Some people still trying to find themselves. I mean, 50 years old, still trying to find themselves. Trying to find out who they are. Hopefully this study helps us understand who we are, why we're here, and what we're called to do. You ought to write that down. Our objective, our goal is to have a life transforming encounter with God. Our goal is to have a life transforming encounter with God. But as we have this life transforming encounter with God, with God we want to know who we are. Why are we here? And what has God called me to do? I told you God has no few members. Everybody called to do something. We want this life transforming encounter with God. And when you have a life transforming encounter with God, you understand three things well. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I called to do? Well, I'm called to do something while I'm here. Why? If I wasn't a preacher, I would be called to do something while I'm here. What am I called to do? How can I make a difference and how can I develop a legacy? Why, why are you here? If you weren't a Sunday school teacher, Brother Whitlock, why would you be here? If you weren't working for a Fortune 500 company, ask yourself, why am I here? If you weren't married, if you weren't single, why are you here? Who am I? Who is this person I see every morning in the mirror, every night before I go to bed? And sometimes all, you know, some brothers stay in the mirror, you know. 
I mean, some brothers, some brothers stay in the mirror more than she does. <laughs> Prepping. I'm still cute. <laughs> That's not why you're here. That's not who you are. That's not what God has assigned you to do. Understand your assignment. That's a, that's a root word right now. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, what do you call it, a pin word right now. Understand the assignment. Why did God place me here? Then why did God place you in the place that you are? Why did God place you with the person you with? Why did God put you with those friends? Why did God allow you to be born in this family? Why did God allow me to get adopted into a different family? Why did God have me to end up in Houston, Texas? Did I just make a decision? Move out here with no family, 600 miles away, so green from four mile Mississippi. It's probably on the map by now. Check it out. Four mile Mississippi. All the way out here. Nine miles from Belzona, nine miles from Inverness, Route 167, Inverness, Mississippi. 38753. That was our address. You know when you got an address that says Route 1, Route 2, Route 2, you way out in the country. There's no, there's no post office. Route 160, Route 67. Route 1, P, Route 1, Box 67. Oh. Wayne King's Plantation. You you so far in the country, you have to pipe moonlight at night. Mm -hmm. But why are you here? Why was I there? And we're going to find out God is doing some things through us right now to get us ready for then. Everything you go through, God is preparing you for the next step, the next level, the next point in your life. God is preparing you for Don't start kicking and screaming and fighting against it. Watch what God is doing. God is working behind the scene. He's doing some things for you that you can't do for yourself. Why am I here? So it matters little. It matters little what the authorities say what human authorities say. Because God judges and God rewards. God judges and God rewards. Who judges? God. Who rewards? God. Why y'all letting all these people get on your nerves then? <laughs> I, I think the young folk are right. You have to sometimes shake the haters off and keep moving. Sometimes people hang on you because they want to be you. That's right. Sometimes people hang on you because you're doing things better than that. You're accomplishing more. And you sitting back wondering, why don't I have this? Why I haven't accomplished this? Why? Well, God, what are you doing? But other folk looking at you and wishing they had what you have. Wishing they were in the position you're in. Supervisors hold people back. They won't sign your transfer because they want to keep you working for them. And then they don't want you to be above them. But I always say this. When the disciple matures, he or she will be better than his or her teacher. When the disciple matures, you ought to be better than your teacher. Because you bring your flavor, you bring your education, you bring your past, you bring your experiences, and then your teacher pour into you, your, 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 your teacher disciple you, your teacher build you up, and you are always supersede your teacher. <laughs> One year my daughter asked me, Dad, why you got to graduate from college five times? I said, so you and your sister can graduate seven times. Every generation ought to be expected to do better than the previous one. 
every generation. Now, how many people in this room have made more money than their parents made in a lifetime already? 100%, I guarantee you. Those of us in this room have lived better, have made more money, have had things given to us more than our parents have in a whole lifetime. You just expected to win. When the songwriter said, I just win, win, win. I just keep on winning. In my day, they would say, I can't lose with the stuff I use. And it ain't even about me, it's about God. I just keep winning, 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 keep winning, winning. God judges and God gives us a reward. John 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Verses 1 through 5. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I will abide in you. This word abide means to dwell, to stay, to settle, to seek deeper. To sink, sink deeper, to go deeper. I, I told you all on Sunday, we got to dig deep. We can't do this shadow stuff. Politics is guiding our lives now. We can't just look at that and be so disturbed. When one party says this is what we put forth and then they vote down their own stuff. We got a, a six ring circus right now. But when we walk with God, God sets the plan for us. God lays it out for us. God blesses us. Regardless of who the president, the vice president, the governor, regardless who's the mayor, God has this thing already figured out. Jesus says, abide in me and I abide in you. As you abide in me, as you sink deeper, as you stay with me, as you dwell with me and let me dwell in you, guess what happens? You are fruitful. The way to, him, to abide in Christ is to obey him. We abide in him by obeying him. We don't have Christ here with us now, so how do we obey him? We obey the word. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. God's word is the truth. We obey the truth. And as we obey the truth, God blesses us. Obey the truth. As I'm lovingly obeying the word of God, as above, as I lovingly obey the word of God, as I lovingly obey the word of God, I'm obeying God. I'm abiding. I'm abiding in him. Lovingly obeying God's word. And when I lovingly obey God's word, this is what happened. I produce much more fruit. As I lovingly obey God, I produce much more fruit. Remember now, he's talking to believers. And as believers lovingly obey the word of God, as we lovingly obey God, as we lovingly obey God, Jesus, as we lovingly obey and submit to the Holy Spirit, we are able to produce much more fruit than what we're producing. That's why I asked the question on Sunday, how much more can you give for the Lord? Are you satisfied with what you do? Are you satisfied with how you think? Are you satisfied with what you're accomplishing? Are you satisfied with how you are doing things now? I tell you, NBA coach said to his players, give me 1% more than you give me. They gave 1% more, and then they became one of the greatest teams of all time. Just 1% more. Pat Riley said, just give me 1% more. And they just built a dynasty. We are able to produce much more fruit when we lovingly, the key word is lovingly, when we do it without complaining, when we do it without looking back, when we do it without saying, man, look at what I'm giving up, look at what I'm losing. 
I'm tired. I have not seen so many young, tired folk in all my days. I'm tired. You, you would tell, you would tell the, the, the senior saints in, in the country, my back hurt. Boy, you ain't got no back. You got a bristle. Get out there and go back to South America. You ain't even got no back. Now we got folks 15, 16, 25 years old, I'm tired. You ain't lived long enough to be tired. Give God what he deserves. Apart from Christ, the believer can accomplish nothing of permanent spiritual value. Apart from Christ, you can accomplish some things, but they will not have spiritual value and it will not be permanent. The stuff we do is fly-by-night stuff. But when we walk with Jesus, we obey Jesus, we are able to accomplish great things, and it will last. Now remember that blue Silverado I used to have? It's up to 350,000 miles. And really hang and still drive. It lasts. I've been through three cars since then. I should have kept <laughs> Some things last and some things don't. What the text is saying is that if you abide in Jesus, your relationship, your fellowship, and your fruit will be greater and greater every day. So it will last. If we will produce more fruit. And apart from Christ, that stuff won't last. He or she who is cast out this word cast out in John chapter 15 means you lose fellowship. Remember, you're Christians. You, can't, you cannot lose your salvation. You are Christians. But you can break fellowship and lose fellowship. If you don't abide in Jesus, it's just so easy to go somewhere else, do something else. Jesus died, buried, rose again, and went looking for the disciples. Guess what they were doing? They gone fishing. They left the ministry and went back fishing. That's how it is with us. If we don't stay close to God, if we don't keep walking with Jesus, if we don't keep doing the things that God has called us to do, then let me tell you, it's so easy to go back into the world, do our own thing. Even if it's not a bad thing, if the focus is not Jesus, it's not a good thing. The believer withers. The word wither means that lose all your vitality. Lose all your energy. Lose all your livelihood. You lose all your strength. You're walking around, but you have no life. You ever seen a young person walk about three steps, and then you got to stop and pull his riches up? <laughs> Man, if the police get out to you, you can't even afford it. You got to stop three times, pull your bridges up. No life, life in this. No, no life in it. No, no vitality. You ever stopped at a red light, the red light turns green, and this person that's, that's a real healthy person, you can tell they're healthy, they're not walking on a cane or anything, and they just mope and cross like they got nowhere to go. That's why I tell you, our youth, move like you're going somewhere. Rapido. Move like you got somewhere to be. Get in a hurry sometimes. I mean, you got senior people walking faster than you are. You got to move like you got somewhere to go. You got to have some life to you. Then it says that he or she is burnt. This word burnt means you lose your rewards. We can't lose our salvation, but we can lose our rewards. Stuff that is stored up for us, we can lose the word fire means that it says that they will be cast into the fire. This word fire means you will be, be in the midst of some fiery trials. If you don't obey Jesus, if you don't walk with God, if you don't give way to the Holy Spirit, then you will find yourself fighting the devil on your own. What if, what if Floyd Mayweather didn't have his corner man and his dad? What if Mike Tyson and and Muhammad Ali didn't have their corner people to, to stop them from bleeding. 
to cheer them on and tell them when they're making their mistake. When you don't walk with Jesus, Jesus is not available to make you who you can become. Failure to abide in Jesus produced spiritual disaster. <laughs> if you choose not to abide in Jesus, you're just a spiritual disaster. Isn't that something? You think you got it going on, you think you're doing things right, but spiritually, you, you're not accomplishing very much. Because guess what? Rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. And as rain falls on the just as well as the unjust, we as Christians go through problems too. Anybody got any problems? Just one or two. Anybody got a different problem than you had Sunday morning? Anybody got any problem that just popped up? And I would not want to have an issue that Jesus can't solve because I had walked away from him. So we got to abide in him. So we won't become a spiritual disaster. As we follow Jesus one day at a time, he keeps us, he will keep us in the center of God's will. As we follow Jesus, and I'm talking about following him one day at a time. The Bible says when you pray, ask God for daily bread. Ask God for daily bread. And as you follow Jesus one day at a time, you are walking in the center of God's will. Yes, we ought to pray for the next day, but we ought to walk with him day by day. Here it is, personal. Personally, I need to maintain a fervent, righteous, intimate relationship with God. I need to maintain a personal, a righteous, a fervent, intimate relationship with God. And that relationship comes in the term of fellowship. I gotta maintain. It's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. Jesus Christ is the only person through which a relationship with God is made possible. You can't get to God without Jesus Christ. If salvation is a person, and it is, salvation is Jesus Christ. If salvation is a person, that salvation comes from Jesus Christ. If sanctification is a person, it is Jesus Christ. If glorification is a person, it is Jesus Christ. Regardless of where we go, we got to acknowledge Jesus Next week, we're going to talk about the, the seven realities of experiencing God. There are seven realities. Some of you have them on the one sheet. Some of you have it on two sheets. If you don't have a handout, come get the one that I have. Next week, we're going to talk about the seven realities of experiencing God. There are seven realities of experiencing God. The first thing you need to understand is God is at work all around you. God is at work. God is doing something. God is always busy. God is always taking care of you. God is at work all around us. And because God is at work, we need to come and join God when he's already at work. Amen. The door of the church is open. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, you can be saved right here, right now. If you would, bow your head with me and trust Jesus as your Savior. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that you are now saved. You're on your way to heaven. We believe that you are going to live forever with God. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord who tithes offering and sacrificial gift. It is time to give to the Lord. You can give by way of envelope. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. Or you can give electronically by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus 
at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Amen. And then the praise reports or prayer requests. Praise reports or prayer requests. Praise reports or prayer requests. Praise report or prayer requests. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a young lady named, I didn't meet her, but another woman met her, and her boyfriend's mom died, and it was so much a burden upon him that he killed himself. Uh, her, the girl's name was Maya, so she's really going through it. A uh, lady at the restaurant that I picked that order up from said, could I have the church lift her up? Okay. Uh, well, I know her name is Maya. Amen. 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 Any other praise report or prayer request? Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, by the way, uh, they called me Friday. I start my new job Monday. I'm mean, Tuesday. Praise God. Then you got six jobs and you've been like that. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to pay the church. I'm going to just hit his time in office. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. Bless him, Lord. Bless him. Yes. Yes, I'm talking about I'm talking about blessing that you have don't have room enough to receive. Overflowing, shaking together, and running over. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. the Lord. Hallelujah. How long you been back? How long you been in town? A month now. A month. And now people been here for 50 years, can't find a job. <laughs> I don't know. Ask them, just ask them, they'll tell you they can't find one. Praise the Lord. Thank Why don't we stand to be dismissed? Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord, for who you are, for what you do. Lord, we thank you, Father, for another privilege, another opportunity, another chance to glorify your name. God, we ask you to continue to bless us, Father God. Continue to bless us to look to you. Bless us to experience you in an awesome way. Bless us, Father God, to realize that you are at work all around us. We need to join you where you're at work. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Give us understanding. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen, amen, amen and amen. amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed. Amen. Thank you for joining us.